tonight in Genesis, we come to a chapter that kind of marks a dividing point. And uh, following this chapter, chapter 36, following this chapter, when we begin chapter 37, we'll be looking at the life of Joseph. And here, as in chapter 35 last week, we just finished how Jacob returned to Bethel. Uh, Jacob, it was a picture of Jacob determining now, Jacob is someone who knows the Lord, just like a Christian who is saved, determining I'm going to live for God. I'm going to spend my time at the house of God. I'm going to live what the New Testament would call the sanctified life, a life where you're set apart for God. We saw this last week. Um, we saw that in, in the sanctified life that there would be separation and service and satisfaction and we saw those things. We also saw that there is uh, sorrow and there's sin because that's just the reality of living down here. So chapter 35 looks at Jacob determining now to, to, to live for God, separated and living for God. Now we get to chapter 36, and this is an interesting chapter. This is one of those chapters with lots of names in it, one of those genealogy type of uh, uh, chapters. Uh, we see this. So let's let's read a little bit and then we'll comment. Now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Remember, Esau is Jacob's brother. They were twins. They came out of the womb, and Esau came just a little bit ahead of Jacob. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibamah, the daughter of Anah, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Bashemoth, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth, and and then it goes on naming all the people that were born to these various women. Uh, for example, end of verse 5, these are the sons of Esau which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. Verse 6, and Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance which he had gotten the land of Canaan and he went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. Now, I guess you could title this chapter, Esau Leaves the Promised Land. Esau uh, grew up with, with his father being Isaac, and he grew up in the Promised Land, and here we see that he takes his wives and his substance and his cattle and everything that he's obtained in the Promised Land, and he leaves the Promised Land and he moves on. This uh, particular chapter, we're going to look at his sons and the kind of lifestyle that they live. And we're going to learn some things about uh, how other people live. Now, it's curious to me that the Holy Spirit would record this in the Scriptures. I think we see a couple of things. Number one, we see the faithfulness of God. This young man, Esau, is a man that despises God, despises his birthright, his spiritual birthright. He sold it for pottage, for a little bowl of pottage. And, and, he, and he hates God's ways, and he hates the people of God. And yet the Lord records in here this man and his sons and his son's sons and his progeny. And it shows, I mean, there's so many names in this chapter. And when I consider it, Look back at the end of uh, chapter 35 and just notice very quickly. I mean, at the end of chapter 35, you look in uh, verse, uh, end of verse 22. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. And then the next few verses, it names those 12 sons. 23, 24, 25, 26, done, finished. And you got this little mention of Jacob's sons. And then all of a sudden you get to chapter 36 and you get this large mention of sons upon sons upon grandsons upon grandsons. And, and wait a second, Jacob is the one that God loves and Esau is the one that hates God. Why so much in this particular chapter? First thing God wants to show you is that, number one, there are more wicked people that hate God than there are people that love God on this planet. He's just giving you an idea of the proportion. I mean, I've got a few verses here of people that love me. i got a whole chapter here of people that hate me. And first, that's the first thing he's showing you. The second thing he's showing and boy, is that the truth down here? Have you noticed that? <laughs> Have you noticed that? I mean, you really want to 
uh, notice it someday. Just, again, go door to door. I mean, when, when it gets warm again and we get into our new building and Lord willing, we're going to go out into those neighborhoods and we're going to start uh, inviting those people to church and bringing some gospel literature and, and wait till you see how the people respond when we go door to door with smiles on our faces and the good news of the gospel in our hands as you'll find they're not, they have no interest in us. I mean, only if we were coming from publishers clearinghouse or sweepstakes i'm sure they'd welcome us in but when we're coming offering the gospel which is more important than some prize that you get from ed mcmahon or something like this but nonetheless they have no interest in it there are more people that do not know god and hate god down here in the world than there are people that love him that's the first thing he shows you the second thing you see is god is faithful even to the people that hate him isn't that amazing Jesus spoke of that back in Matthew. And I think it was Matthew chapter 5. Just very quickly, I want to show you. When Jesus was speaking one day about his father and how precious his father was, he says, I say unto you, Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. That ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son and that means the sun in heaven, to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. You see, your Father in heaven is perfect. And He's faithful. And He's going to meet the needs of people down here on this planet that even hate Him. And so that's another reason we see this particular chapter with Esau. And God's showing this because you're going to see these, these people were taken care of. Now, one of the things we see in the very first verse of this chapter is these are the generations of Esau. Okay, I know that name. Who is Edom? And now God here changes Esau's name to Edom. Now this is not something new. We see God change names a lot in the scriptures. For example, Abram was changed to Abraham. Uh, uh, Sarai was changed to Sarah. Uh, Jacob was changed to Israel. Uh, we'll see in the New Testament, Simon is changed to Peter. And we see how God changes names. Now here is a change in name from Esau to Edom. The only difference is God doesn't tell Esau that he did it. God tells us he did it, and it's recorded for us here. But it's not recorded that God ever told uh, Esau, Oh, by the way, Esau, your name is now Edom. Why is that? Well, God's not talking to Esau. Because Esau doesn't have a relationship with God. So God records it for us here because this is a downward move in his name. Going from Esau to Edom is a downward move, like going from Lucifer to Satan. And the Lord wants us to know that he has names in his mind and in his heart for the people down here. For example, he's got a name, a new name for every one of us. And he'll reveal it to us someday, person to person, face to face. Well, he's got names uh, for Esau, and it's Edom. That's the name he has. Uh, God has nothing to say to non-believers. The only thing he has to say to a non-believer is, uh, my son died for your sins. He has the good news of the gospel for non-believers. But in terms of personal relationships, he doesn't have one, and so he does not talk to non-believers. That's the first thing to know. The second thing to know is he doesn't hear the prayers of non-believers. When non-believers pray, and, and I talk to people that don't know the Lord, and they tell me they pray, and I don't know why they bother to do it. God's not hearing their prayers. The Lord does not listen to the prayers of the non-believer. John chapter 17, when we get to John 17, we'll study it. But Jesus makes it very clear that only Jesus is capable of carrying a prayer to God. And he maketh intercession for us, but Jesus said, I, I pray not for the world. So when people in the world, the Edoms, the Esau's of the world, get on their knees to pray, their, their prayers bounce off the ceiling and go right back down. They don't go to God. God doesn't talk to non-believers. He doesn't hear the prayers of non-believers. There's only one prayer that he will hear from a non-believer. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And we're going to see in this chapter that Esau doesn't have that attitude. Esau's not humble enough. The Edoms of the world aren't humble enough. So, so the first thing we see is the change in the name. Now, the second thing I want you to see is that Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan. 
Now notice he took his wives, plural. Now what you're going to see here is a picture. Esau is going to be a picture of a man living after the flesh rather than living after the spirit. Esau represents the flesh. Jacob represents the spirit. Esau is the old birth. Jacob is the new birth, Jacob becoming Israel. And so we're going to see how these men live down here, and I want to show you some things as I was reading through the chapter that I saw. The first thing that I observed is he took wives, plural. He took wives, plural. The first thing you're going to see about people who live like Esau, who live after the flesh, are that they're, they like polygamy. It's one of their pleasures. These type of people live for pleasure, and one of the pleasures they have is members of the opposite sex, multiple members of the opposite sex. It's polygamy. This is what it's like to live after the flesh. In the scriptures, you're going to see that polygamy is uh, shown a number of times. It is prevalent in scripture. God does not condone it, but it's prevalent. You'll find it in Genesis. As a matter of fact, we saw it back in the fourth chapter. The first time we saw it was one of the sons of Cain that took multiple wives to himself. Now, God said that one man should take one woman to be his wife, should leave mother and father, should cleave unto that woman, and they should weave their lives together as one. That's the way the Lord would have it. What do the people of the flesh do? They fight the Spirit of God, and they go after the pleasures of this world. This is prevalent, prevalent in the Scriptures. You know where else prevalent prevalent in society. We live in a culture that has polygamy. You say, well, these people aren't getting married. Well, a lot of them do. There's marriage and divorce and marriage and divorce and marriage and... Jesus said that would be a sign of the last times. They'd be marrying and giving in marriage. That's one of the things we have nowadays. There are very few people that in this society of America that we live in where there's one man that married one woman and they stayed together till death parted them. Marriage and divorce is common. I I'm one of them. I mean, long, long, long time ago, when I was in pre-medical school, I married a girl. And uh, after three years, the marriage was broken up. It's the culture we live in, but it's as old as the hills. You see, we seem to think that things have changed, but God's showing you. The, the ways of the flesh have been like that all the way back, right after the garden, right after the fall, the ways of the flesh. This is the way it is in society. It's a sign of, of, of lasciviousness and a work of the flesh. That's in the book of Galatians, chapter 5. It's a work of the flesh. Esau is a picture of a man living after the flesh. And lasciviousness and multiple marriages are one of those signs. It's a pleasure that's taken. You, you enjoy the member of the opposite sex until they no longer give you pleasure. You get rid of them and you find a new pleasing one. And this is what's been going on and this is how Esau lives. Uh, it is forbidden in the scriptures. Deuteronomy 17, 17, thou shalt not multiply wives unto thyself. I mean, we know what God's will is, and yet we see it, and, and the Bible's showing you this. And again, this is the picture, 36, of the wicked, the multiplication of the wicked, the transgressors on the earth, and this is the way they live. It's one of the first things that we see. The other thing that we see as we go through this chapter is has he multiplied wives, and has he multiplied children? Verse 6, And Esau took his wives, and his sons, and his daughters, and all the persons of his house, and his cattle, and all his beasts, and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan, and he went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. Now he leaves the promised land. Why? Verse 7, For their riches were more than that they might dwell together. So another thing you're going to find out about people that live after the flesh is their possessions are big in their life. And possessions cause division rather than unity. And this is the picture you're seeing right here. I mean, as, as this man got more and more and more, you think he would be satisfied. You think he would be settled with his life. You think he would be pleased. You think he'd want to share with his family members like Jacob. Instead, he wants to take these possessions and hoard them and move away. Possessions lead to separation. 
And so another thing we see about people like this that live after the flesh is possessions are more important to them than family and people. That's a strange thing. But there's a covetousness on the inside. There's a lust on the inside for, for material wealth that causes problems within families. This is found all the time. You know, they did a study on people that won the lottery. Now, you would think, hey, that's the big jackpot. I mean, that's what everybody wants to hit. I mean, even we want to hit it, folks, Christians. Uh, now, we shouldn't want to. I understand that that's, uh, that's our old nature inside. That's the Esau inside of us. And the Bible says, he that hasteth to be rich shall not be innocent. He that hasteth to rich hath an evil eye. He that hasteth to rich considereth not the poverty that shall come upon him. And one of the poverties that will come is the fracturing, uh, fracturing of the family relationships. And that's exactly what happened here. And the study of these people that won the lottery found that their family relationships were pretty much destroyed within a two-year period. Why? Why is that? That's a funny thing. I mean, you, you, I don't know how much these lotteries pay nowadays. I don't play them. I'm not sure. What's the standard lottery? Is it $3 million, Something like that? I think it's right around $3 million or something. Now, if I understand it right, I, I, I think that's what it used to be. You know, there's some guy, you, when I'm driving to work, there's this big billboard. And this kind of bald guy there, you know, and he says, you never know. And then it says, today's lotto is such and such, you know. And, and it seems like, the, it builds up, but it seems like when I drive by when it's starting, it starts at like three or something like that. Okay, well, if you live in New York State, which we have a little tax here. It's called an income tax in New York State, a small one. Not much. I mean, it's, I think it's 50th out of the 50 states. Or, or is it first? It's very high. Anyways, the point is, if you live in New York State, the way these lotteries go, I guess they don't give you all the money at once. It's over 20 years. So, so uh, let's see, three million divided by 20. That's 150 thousand a year. It's 150 grand a year. Okay. Uh, and so then, 150 thousand a year, the tax has got to come out of that. So I mean, by the time Uncle Sam and and uh, and New York State gets their piece, it probably works out to be about 100 thousand per year. So 100,000 per year. Now here's the thing, your family thinks you just won 3 million. That's what they think. And they don't they didn't do the math like we just did. So they think, wow, this guy just dropped like 3 million dropped out of the sky. Now 3 million is a lot of money. 100,000 a year is not a lot of money. That goes pretty quickly. That can go pretty quickly. You want a nice uh, half million dollar house? I only got $100,000. You're going to have to mortgage that thing. You want some cars are $100,000. All of a sudden, by the time you spent the money on yourself, you don't have much to give to your family, and they're real angry and resentful about it, and the family's broken up. And, and families break up. Possessions cause the breakup of families, and that's what the, the Bible's showing you right here. Here's a man of the world. He's got ample possession. He's not satisfied, and he's not trusting his other family members who wants what I have. And, and, and he's putting the walls up. And one of the ways he does it is he just leaves. He departs and goes somewhere else. He moves to, the, you know, to Arizona or something and gets himself a spread there away from the family. doesn't have to listen to them anymore. And that's the possessions do this. Now let me show you. Turn to Psalm 52. You're going to see what it's like to live after the flesh rather than after the spirit. And you're going to thank God that you're saved. When you see this picture in chapter 36, you're going to thank God you're saved. It is good to be saved. It is good to have Jesus Christ as your Savior. It is good to have the Holy Spirit imparted. It is good, finally, to be able to love others rather than love possessions, to care for people rather than to think only about yourself. Psalm 52. Psalm 52. This particular psalm, David is talking about Doeg the Edomite, who was a wicked man that lived after the flesh. Notice, he was an Edomite. Doeg the Edomite, okay? Someone that lives after the flesh. Someone, he says, Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O mighty man? Thy tongue devises mischief, like a sharp razor. And he goes on and on. He says, verse 7, This is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. This is a picture of people that look toward their riches and their possessions
to be the end in life. Jesus talked about people that either serve God or serve mammon. Mammon is money and mammon is material things. It is possessions. It's more than just money. It's material things. And this man, this Edom, this Esau, he lives after the flesh. He wants to make the abundance of his riches the thing that he trusts in. And when you trust in that, you want to protect it from someone else. And we see him leaving Jacob and leaving Isaac and leaving the promised land because of those possessions. Don't ever let your money take you away from God and away from the house of God. I don't know why someone would do that. I think they would do it if they don't know God. But if you know God, <laughs> forget the money. God, God is our supply. God's our source. God's our all in all. But Esau has no concept of this, and he, and he leaves, and he's trusting in his riches. Let me show you a warning in 1 Timothy chapter 6 in the New Testament. Men of the flesh, they love pleasure, they love polygamy, they love possessions. 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> And verse 17. <clears throat> now, Paul's speaking to a young man, Timothy. And where Timothy is ministering, there are some people that have money. And there are some people that have money that got saved. And so Paul says, I want you to teach these people that got saved about how they should consider their possessions and their riches. And he tells them this in verse 17, 617, 1 Timothy 617. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they may do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. In other words, he's saying, unlike the man in Psalm 52 who's trusting in his riches and in his abundance and he's getting away from God and hoarding it with his possessions, he's saying, look, when God blesses you, if God's given you something and you're rich in this world, don't be high-minded and think, I got this by my own wisdom. I got this by my own a cunning. I got this by my own ability. Realize that if you have any cunning or wisdom or ability, it was a gift from God. And so therefore, the possessions are a gift from God. Trust in the living God. And he gave you these things richly, not only to enjoy, but to do good and to be rich in good works and ready to distribute and willing to communicate to others because you'll find many needy people around you. And someone like Esau says, you know, what if Jacob you know, needs something or what if Jacob's kids need something and they know that I'm rich? Oh, boy, I better get away from them. And so he moves somewhere else. God says, share. Distribute. Communicate. Help. Bless, be a blessing, and be blessed. Just the opposite, just the opposite. But the men of the world, possessions cause separation. Esau separated by his possessions. Let me show you another thing about Esau that we learn in this chapter. So he decides we'll leave the promised land. Because of my possessions, my riches. I can't dwell with these other folks. You know, you know another reason sometimes people separate, and this is a strange thing, and I've seen this happen. I never quite understood it, but it's real, and I've heard it discussed. You get a, a group of guys that know each other from high school. They've been friends all through high school, good friends. They go on, and they get past the college years, and they're in their 20s. And then as they start to, to work, one of them becomes successful and the others don't. And then all of a sudden, the one that's successful feels he has to separate from the others because of social status. Because now, you know, people tell him, you know, those are the guys you used to hang out with back then, but you know, you're better than that now. I mean, look at the way they dress and look at the way you ought to be dressing in silk shirts and Rolex watches and better cars. You, you really can't associate with them anymore. That's a high-mindedness that goes on with possessions. This social status and, you know, that we have in society. And, and this is another reason, I think, that maybe Esau left. But that's, God will have nothing to do with that. In Christ Jesus, there's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor servant. 
our, our, our servant nor, nor master. There's, there's neither uh, uh, black nor white, nor rich nor poor, uh, Jew nor Gentile. In Christ Jesus, all those boundaries are broken down. But in the world, those boundaries still exist. And I met people that would talk about that, about how they had to leave their friends or leave their family. You know, my family's kind of uh, such and such of a region. You know, they speak a certain way. And now that I've gotten this money and I've been to finishing school, this is the kind of thing, another reason that causes possessions to work in someone that's high-minded to separate from their family. The Bible's recording this. It's not condoning this. It's saying avoid this. This is written as an example for you to learn from not to do it. And there's two kinds of examples in life. The ones you want to emulate and follow and the ones you want to avoid. And the Bible's writing this for you. So he leaves because of these riches. He can't dwell with these folks anymore. And notice where he goes. Verse 8, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Then he reminds you, Esau is Edom. He told you that in verse 1. Now he's telling you again, Esau is Edom. God's going to reiterate this over and over. Esau's now Edom. I don't think of him as Esau anymore. I think of him as Edom. He's moved down a step. But where is he living? He's moved into Mount Seir. Mount Seir. Not only does he have possessions, he has a certain place that he likes to reside. The place that he chose is a place called Mount Seir. Now, on a map, I'll just show you historically where it was and where it is. They were living up here in the land of Israel, in the promised land. And he decided to take his possessions and he moved south. Not a very good direction. And then he moved east, an even worse direction. And he found a mountain range down here in the land of Edom at the southern eastern part of the Dead Sea called Mount Seir. And it's built way up high on this particular mountain. And he, he got himself up on a nice perch where he could look down on everyone else. And he also felt up high, he was in a position where he'd be protected, that no one could come get his possessions from him. Seer means a rough place or a wooded place. He's living in a rough, wooded place. You know, when you live all alone, high on that perch, you know, it's rough up there. It's not easy. It, it, God made us social creatures. We need companionship. And when you get all alone at the top, like he has in his own mind, it's, it's, it's lonely at the top. And he's moving to a place of isolation. This is the place he's living in. Now, the place is described later on in a small book on only one chapter, the only book that's one chapter in the Old Testament. It's called the book of Obadiah. Obadiah. After Daniel, there's Hosea, Joel, Amos, and then Obadiah. It's the fourth minor prophet, the book of Obadiah. This little book is like an atom bomb. <laughs> it's just one chapter. And, and God in here speaks what he thinks about Esau and Edom. Uh, look at verse 1. The vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. And then he talks about the problems with Edom. He talks about uh, verse 2. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Notice verse 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? I'm number one. I'm number one. Mm -hmm. I am the champion, my friend. You know, that kind of stuff. That's the <laughs> attitude that the men of the flesh have. The pride. You, know, you ever hear that? You know, it's a lot in this country. People talk about pride. These ball teams talk about pride. You know, God's not big on pride. Do you know that's one of the things he hates? Matter of fact, that's the number one thing he hates in Proverbs chapter 6. That's the number one thing he hates in, in, is pride. Because pride is the mentality or the thought that you've done it without God and you don't need God and you can live without God. Taking credit for everything you do. As, as opposed to giving thanks to the one to whom gave you the ability and talent in the first place. And this man has pride. And his pride deceives him. Why? Because the heart's deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things. And so he makes this, this habitation up high. And he says, who's going to bring me down to the ground? Verse 4. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou art set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. You know, Everyone that exalts himself, the Bible says, shall be abased. 
What goes up must come down. The way to get lifted up in Scripture is to humble yourself, and then the mighty hand of God will lift you up. But if you climb that mountain on your own, and you don't acknowledge God, the same hand that lifts others up will, will swat you down. And God will see to it that you'll fall. You have to be careful about pride. I get a little concerned about the nation we live in because they talk about American pride and the pride of the stars and the stripes. And, and this nation is far from God. This nation is not reading the Bible anymore. Uh, there are Bibles in homes. I don't think anybody reads them. I'm almost sure the TV guide gets read more than the Bible. Anybody doubt that? Nobody doubts that. Uh, the newspaper, we know that gets read more than the Bible. Well, you're not getting good things in the newspaper and in TV guide. You're getting the spirit and the philosophy of the Esau's and the Edom's of the world. The pleasures and, and the pride and the possessions. The place, his place is one of pride. And that's, and that's the kind of thing that goes on in unsaved minds and hearts. It's a deceiving thing. And so this is the place, that high, exalted place. Everybody's telling us to fight and to move up the corporate ladder. You know, what I say is, why don't we just be honest? Why don't we just love people? Why don't we just do a good job and let God lift us up? If God wants to lift us up, he will. You know, if you just, if we do everything like that, for example, in... I just got on, somebody talked to me today about the possibility of, of a job. I've been out of work for a while and I'm doing some part-time work. And uh, as I met this gentleman a few weeks ago and he said, I've been thinking about you all week and, and they have a new job that they might have for me. And I came home and told my wife about it and uh, I prayed about it before. And I said, you know, I'm not gonna do anything about it. We're gonna let the Lord work. If the Lord desires it to happen, I'll get that. If I start selling myself, then maybe I got it because Let the Lord work it out. Let the Lord work it out. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a good job at what I do, and if, if I'm asked, then I'll take it from God's hand that somebody has asked me to do it. That's the way I want to do it, but I don't want my pride to get into it. We don't want pride to get into it. We want to do a good job. We want to love people and let the Lord lift us up and take us through life. This book of Obadiah is an interesting book, but we'll get back to where we are in Genesis because I want to show you the things that go on in men that live after the flesh. As I read through this, and, and then, uh, so we see he, he dwells in this Mount Seir. Verse 9, And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons, and there's many names, and I could read them all. We'll get to verse 11, And the sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, Kenaz, and Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. And these were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. Now I want you to look at that name Amalek or Amalek. And you can mark that name in your Bible. This is a name you're going to see as you go through the scriptures. The Amaleks are, are a warlike people. As a matter of fact, the name Amalek means warrior. And in the very next book, Exodus chapter 17... Exodus chapter 17, right after the Lord delivers the people from Egypt... And right after the Lord brings the Red Sea upon the Egyptians in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8, then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And so there's a, a battle that goes on and Amalek picks a fight with, with God's people. Notice Amalek started the fight with God's people. And, and this battle goes on and, and, and the Lord tells his people to defend themselves and to fight back. And of course, verse 13, I want you to see a key verse. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, if an Amalek, I wanted you to learn in this passage, Amalek is a picture of the flesh. Okay? And what, what the Bible is showing you is right after you get saved, right after God gets you out of Egypt, right after God gets you saved and gives you the new birth and brings you across the Red Sea, you know who's going to fight with you? Your flesh. Your flesh is going to pick a fight with you. 
And Amalek, we see, is a type of the flesh because he's one of the sons of Esau. And Esau is a picture of the flesh. So I wanted you to see that. And of course, uh, the one that will beat that, win that battle is Joshua, the Lord Jesus. And his people, he fought Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. He uses the Bible, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. That's the way you win the battles with the flesh. You need to get in the prayer closet with Jesus and you need to let him apply the Word to win those battles against your flesh. And, and here's what uh, the end of the chapter, verse 16. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Every generation of new Christians that comes up, there's going to be a battle with the flesh, and God's going to have to fight with them. So I wanted you to learn where Amalek came from. That's, go back to Genesis 36. That's the first time you see Amalek in your Bible, and Amalek is the son of Esau, and that's a picture of the flesh. Just as Esau, the father flesh, uh, birthed a son in his own likeness. And you know what I learned about Amalek? He's pugnacious. <laughs> Starting with P. Likes to fight. The flesh is a fighter. The flesh will fight with you. You're going to have to battle with the flesh practically every day. You're going to see that tendency. You see, the flesh not only will come at you in terms of pleasure and possession and pride, but it's going to fight with you. When you want to do something right, the flesh is going to rise up and say, you don't want to do that. Hey, you, on a Sunday morning, when it's time to get up for church, the flesh is going to say, you know what? You don't get many days where you can sleep, and this is a good day. To, you can pick a, put a little fight in your mind with you. These kind of things are going to go on. Amalek in, is going to fight with you. Esau is going to fight with you. Praise the Lord for Joshua that's going to win those battles for you and is going to beat Amalek with the sword. But I wanted you to see that. Another thing I noticed as I went down there, all of a sudden, when you get to verse 15, you see this. These were the dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau. Here we go. Duke Timon, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kenaz, Duke Korah, Duke Etam, Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came of Eliphaz. And you're going to see more dukes. You keep going through and you see dukes. And matter of fact, 42 times you're going to find the word uh, duke in this place. I told you that. I told you Amalek's a fighter. Put up your dukes. 42 times you're going to see it. By the way, the new Bibles change that. They don't use the word dukes. It's, you know what? They just don't get it. They just they don't get it. He, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says hey. in the churches. This Amalek's a fighter. He's got lots of dukes. He's putting up his dukes. But I'll show you another thing that has to do about it. Is, is not only is pugnacious, but, but it's another thing. It has to do with position. Another people about um, living after the flesh... They like a certain position in life. <laughs> now, the position they like here are being called dukes. Now, look, when you we talk about terms of royalty, I, I found seven in the dictionary. There's a king, there's a prince, there's a duke, there's a, a marquis, there's an earl or a count, a viscount, and a baron. So let me see, that makes the duke of earl lower than the earl of duke. Now that I think about that, according to, yeah, because the duke of earl, no, he'd be higher than the earl of duke. The Duke of Earl's higher. Well, good. That's they wrote the song properly, Duke of Earl. So, but anyway, those are the different. But you know, it's interesting. These these titles of royalty. Notice these people. Uh, they just took these titles to themselves. They just took these titles of duke to themselves. You know, when I was out in the workplace a long time ago, first job I ever had was at a car wash. And I just did anything I was told. I had to wash the cars. I had to dry the cars. I had to pump the gas. Sometimes I had to take the rags and throw them in the dryer or washer and wash them and then put them in the dryer and dry them. I just did everything. And all of a sudden, one guy wanted to be called like the superintendent of, uh, of pumping gas. And one guy wanted to be called. Everybody wanted these titles. You know, they wanted a position. And one day, my cousin Mark, who had a real funny sense of humor, had come with a little... Uh, pieces of wood and he painted all these uh, titles all over for everybody. We're nothing more than common attendants at a car wash. But it's a funny thing. People like positions. People like positions. They like some kind of a title before their name or after their name. And this shows you how the flesh is. Why? Again, it plays into the pride. And these people, these Esau's, like their position. So they pick the position of, of Duke. And, uh, 
And so there we see it all through here. 42 times you're going to see the word Duke put through here. But not only that, after a while, as you get later on, it's not going to be sufficient to them. By the time you get to the 31st uh, verse, we've had all these Dukes, and verse 30, Duke Daishan, Duke Izar, Duke Daishan. These are the Dukes that came of Horai and the Dukes of the land of Seir. And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. Now they're going to become kings. Now position isn't only enough for these people. They want power too. They want power. They want to be the most powerful of all the people with position. So now they want to be kings. Now, this, this is not uncommon. And, and I was reading the World Book Encyclopedia on kings and, and title of sovereignty and talking about how kings came about. And many kings just exalted themselves. I mean, they became a monarch of a region and they had some vassal serfs. And, and they just, this is exactly what the Bible is showing you right here. These people became king before God gave any kings down here. As a matter of fact, in the book of Daniel, it tells you that God setteth up kings. But Esau can't wait. Esau wants to get ahead of God. The flesh, people that live by the flesh want to get ahead of God. They can't wait for God's program. And they want power. Now, now turn to Psalm 62. Psalm 62. God records these things for our learning. These are examples for us to turn away from. For us to see and to reveal to our children and say, this is how you not this is how you do not want to live. Psalm 62. Psalm 62. These people wanted power. These people wanted to be king. But in Psalm 62, it tells us, rather than getting ahead of God, verse 1, truly my soul waiteth upon God. You want to wait for God. Verse 5, my soul Wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. Verse 11, God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. These particular kings here, you're going to see about these kings, and, and this is an ungodly sort of kings that you're going to have. Matter of fact, go back to where we were in uh, Genesis chapter 36. You know, God would like to set a king that reigns in righteousness and has just judgment. Esau couldn't wait for that. The Edomites up there living up uh, on the high rock in pride with their position and their possessions and decided to become kings on themselves. Now notice some of the things that happened. Verse 34, And Husham died. And Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. You know what kind of king? They're showing you these, these kings are murderous. They're murderous kings. They take their power and they abuse it. They, take, they steal power unjustly. We see this example throughout the scriptures throughout the scriptures. And the Bible's pointing this out right here. God would set up kings in a decent and orderly fashion, but the men of the world would go to it ahead of time. And where do you think Saddam Hussein come from? I mean, he came from Syria. And he was a button man, like a mob button man that came over to Iraq. And he murdered a number of people and he ascended to his throne unrighteously, just like the picture right here. This is the kind of thing that goes on. These people that lust for power. The lust for power. I think one of the reasons they lust for power so much is they realize that if you have power, you get the rest. If you have power, you get the polygamy, you get the pleasure, you get the possessions, you get the place of pride. You can be as pugnacious as you want because you've got the top position. You're top dog. That's why they lust for power. You know, power is, is greater than riches. People sometimes wonder. They say, oh, it's the money that gets power. No, power gets money. Proof. <laughs> Have an empty room. Take two guys go into the room. One guy going with a million dollars, another guy with a machine gun. See who emerges from the room. <laughs> power. The lust for power. That's the flesh. The lust for power. What do we want? We want the power from on high, the power of the Holy Spirit. We want to live after the power of the Spirit. So this interesting chapter here, as we go through here, 
we, we, we see all the dukes and we see all the kings and we see all the murderous tendencies that they have and the way that they live contrary to God after the flesh. And we see here, it ended up Duke Magdiel and Duke Iram, verse 43. These be the dukes of Edom according to their habitations in the land of their possession. He is Esau, the father of the Edomites. For the last time, God tells us that Esau is Edom. Esau is Edom. Now, what do the names mean? Esau means hairy. Edom means red. Edom means red. Like raw meat. Like you cut it open and it's, it's just full of the blood. And it's red. Now, this is the corruptible blood of the earth. It's that... That red tendency. Now, it's interesting. Is it, it, red is a very important color. As a matter of fact, uh, red. One of his sons' names. Watch this. Go back to verse eleven. The sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman. T e m a n. Teman means sunburnt. 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 Now, when you go out in the sun and you have too much, a red quality comes over your body. Edom is red. Now, now, what does that mean? Okay, here's the way it works. When you study the electromagnetic spectrum, like, a, like the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, the longer wavelengths are on the red side. The red and the infrared are very healthy rays. Life on this planet is due to the health-giving rays on the red side of the spectrum. For example, what color are plants? Green. Do you know why? Because they absorb the red, they reflect the green. All the healthful rays that bring forth photosynthesis come on the red side of the spectrum. Remember, the sun gives off the spectrum, and it is the red rays that give the health and the life to the plants. What is Edom? See, if something is green, it's absorbing the red. And reflecting the green. Edom is red. He is sunburnt. What has he done? He is now reflecting the red rays of the sun. He's saying, I want nothing to do with your rays, S-U-N. And the sun is a picture of what? The S-O-N. It's a picture of God. Because the Lord Jesus Christ would like to wash your sins in the redness of his blood. And Edom reflects it off and says, I want nothing to do with that healthy red blood of the Savior of God. I'm sunburnt. I reflect the red. I do not absorb the red. And that's what that's a picture of. Edom, Esau is Edom. He is red. He has nothing to do with God or God's ways. That's what the picture going on in this particular chapter. And you see what it's like to live after the raw flesh and reject the healthy, giving life spirit from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and reflect off the red. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, because God will wash them in the red blood of his Son. And Esau says, I'm already red. I don't need that. I don't need that. Go thy way, spirit. Go thy way, Son of God. Let me take my possessions and separate and leave the Holy Land and go up to a position of pride and power and live on my own up high upon the rock where no one will bring me down. That's what this is a picture of in this chapter. And God just wants to show it to you and yet God says I'm faithful enough that I allow him to continue to live on my planet and still bless him with possessions. You know, God is amazingly good. Again, look at Saddam Hussein and his family. Look at the way they lived. I mean, if I were God, I would squash those guys before they even took their first step. But the Lord is long-suffering and merciful. We serve a great God. And the great thing is, He's willing to reach out to anyone. You know, if Edom would just get out of the sun for a few days and let that sunburn go away and then come back and say humbly, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. God would save him. You know, God would have saved Saddam Hussein and his kids. By the way, I prayed for their salvation. That would have ended things a lot quicker than any war. If Jesus Christ had gotten in their hearts and changed them. But the Lord records this for us to show you that the wicked 
multiply down here on the earth and transgression increase it. You know, an interesting thing, I just want to show you something else. I was up this morning, I was working out, and I had, uh, what's his name on, John Heggie, and they were talking about, turn to uh, Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah 18. This is just an extra, just for fun. They were talking about the Harry Potter books and the fact that it's a lot of witchcraft and it really draws you in. And apparently this woman that wrote these books, apparently she did a lot of research on witchcraft and people who've read their books wondered and even asked her how much she knows about Wicca. Wicca apparently is a, a sanctioned religion in this country mm -hmm. by the IRS. It, it is religion. And so these are, these are religious books about, about witchcraft as the Harry Potter books. And uh, I thought this was very curious today because I wonder where does this come from and who likes these kind of books? Who likes books like this? In Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. And uh, verse 5, Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. O house of Israel. So, so God is like a potter, and people are like clay. And today, one of the biggest books out there, the Pied Piper that's getting everybody ready for the last days, is uh, Harry Potter. Oh. Harry Potter, Esau, flesh. It appeals to the flesh. And it's, it, I just thought that was interesting. I was, I was looking at that thing and go, my goodness, since I'm teaching this chapter, it just lines right up. I mean, it's, it's a picture of the flesh. It's getting all these little sons of men and appealing to their flesh and getting ready to lead them up to the high place of pride with their powerful sorcery where God's going to have to smack them down someday. We need to pray for them. We need to help them. We need to bring truth to them. Maybe we can send them this tape and they'll see who's leading them. Curious. Any questions on what we studied in the 36th chapter? Because next week it's going to be fun. We're going to talk about the greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ in this uh, book, and that's Joseph. Let's pray on what we learned today. Father, we thank you for uh, showing your faithfulness to Esau, who was Edom. And uh, Lord, you're still merciful to these people down here today in the flesh. You were merciful to us when we were living in the flesh. Lord, I pray you'd save us from our own flesh. May Joshua discomfit the flesh in us by the sword. And help us to live after the Spirit. And Lord, help us to, um, to reach out to these people. And Lord, help us to bring them to Jesus. And to bring them away from their possessions, away from their pride, away from their power and their position. And help us to bring them to the person of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.